Hello, welcome to Network. My name is Pamela Lezondi with your technology and social media news. It is SABC Network on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram News Network at sabc.co.za on email. This week, our Twitter poll is asking you how you watch your feature films in 2022. This, as for the very first time, a streaming platform film won an Oscar award. Results of that are coming up later in the program. Firstly, here's what's coming up in this program. We have the latest on digital migration of television. We give you details on how technology can help resuscitate the travel and tourism industry. And in our conversation, we chat about data breaches as a TransUnion's hack is resulting in a lot more information possibly being shared with the public. 2015 was the deadline for TV to migrate from analog to digital and South Africa didn't do this for seven years. And in the last week, we saw conflict between the communications minister and broadcasters, especially the SABC. Like many other countries in the rest of the world, South Africa is moving from analog terrestrial television to digital broadcasting. A move away from analog to digital will free up the cluttered frequency spectrum, meaning it becomes available for other wireless sources. The reason behind this is that digital transmission affords far superior quality in terms of color, sound and brightness, and it will also result in more TV channels being available. What this means for consumers is that if they are currently accessing any channels on an analog TV, they will no longer be able to do so after the switch over. Putting the, the, the switch off date as, as early as, as March next year is going to leave millions of South Africans without television. So, you know, this has got a long, tedious, uh, uh, difficult history. We've, we've missed deadlines, there have been delays, there have been all sorts of uh, issues. Post Office is calling on qualifying households to apply for a free set-top box as the country prepares for migration. All South African households with an income of 3,500 per month or less and a working television set qualify for a government-subsidized set-top box. Those with integrated digital television, which has a built-in digital tenor, will not need a set-top box to receive digital signals. With the move from analog to DTT, I'm actually grateful that I don't have to buy the set-top box because I have a smart TV. If um, the, the likes of your Syntec and the broadcasters say that you're in an area where you will receive um, digital TV, then it's a really a, a plug and play scenario of putting up an antenna outside your house or sometimes indoors, uh, depending on where the signal comes from. TV manufacturers like Skyworth say they are launching smart TVs that do away with set of boxes, cables, and a dish on the side of the house. We, we saw the gap in the digital space. We saw that the government wanted to move over to digital, so the first TV was a digital TV. So we started testing all over in South Africa, um, making sure that our products are uh, up to standard, that the digital um, receivers are built in our TVs and they're working. Uh, they were tested by Sense and Tech. Um, uh, they actually had a satellite receiver as well at one stage. Uh, just to make sure that everything on them were working. The smart TVs, which are connected with Wi-Fi using any broadband network, are already available in stores across the country. If you look at the, the smart DT um, TVs, then you have the best of both. Uh, really, so if you are in an area with uh, digital signal, then you'll pick up all the free-to-air uh, channels. Um, you just need to install, obviously, the antenna. Um, and then if uh, the signal becomes, uh, your internet signal becomes popular in your area via fiber or 5G or 4G, whatever, whatever signal you can pick up in your area, then you'll be able to access, um, uh, like I said, over 7,000 apps 
and um, you can watch what you want when you want. Some say one of the major draw cards for the uptake of digital migration is access to compelling content. Because of obviously the demands of the millennials and how they have just changed the landscape in terms of the power they possess, they know that uh, for a news organization or a content producer to be able to be recognized, they need to have a solid audience rating in terms of who is consuming their content, what type of you know, financial uh, uh, status do they have in, in, in society, how are they consuming this content, and what's the reason that's driving them to com consume this content in that manner. They come preloaded with apps including content from the likes of Netflix, Disney Plus, and Spotify, and all of your favorite apps into one device. Having an Android TV as opposed to another um, operating system won't limit you to watch what that manufacturer has uh, put on, um, uh, you know, the apps on the TV. Because you can just go on a Google Play Store and download uh, thousands of more apps. The post office branches have standard affidavits that the applicants can use to declare their income, confirm that they own a working television set, and confirm their residential address. The Drakensberg, where I am today, divides South Africa and Lesotho. And the mountain range in KwaZulu Natal would often see a lot of tourists coming in from international destinations. But like many other tourist destinations, they dried out during the height of the COVID 19 pandemic. We saw a lot of countries and organizations saying that technology could possibly help bring a tourist back. But can it going forward? At the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, Hotel Sky launched in Santon. Its staff members include robots. Welcome to Hotel Sky. This would limit human contact and possibly help in reducing human-to-human -human transmission of any illness. Robots will never ever replace people, never. Um, especially in, in a hospitality environment where you know, we, we are we're humans that want people contact. We want that social interaction and, and robots just can't do that. But what they can do is they can offer you a great concierge experience. This was one of the ways many around the world said the travel industry will change in the post-COVID era. In other parts of the world, some piloted UV lights as a method to sanitize airplanes again a future some thought would be. We really had to make this system autonomous, so we switch it on, we leave, the machine makes the disinfection, all the plane, all around, and then it stops automatically, so the worker are not in contact with the, the, the machine, and also UVC doesn't make any traces or uh, chemistry, so that's also very important for the traveler that you know that you have a safe place and there is no chemical residue on the, on the seats or no, everywhere. There were also those who said biometric systems could be introduced in airports. The travel industry was one of the hardest hit during the COVID-19 pandemic. Gradually we are seeing uh, businesses open, we are seeing workers returning to work. We are excited at what we are seeing, even though we were hard knocked, but I think we will come through. Uh, businesses are opening. Those in the industry say it's not quite robots that will resuscitate things in South Africa. But they are adamant that it's still technology, other forms of technology that is, that will help here. We have also introduced a tourism digital transformation program. They have been enrolled into that tourism digital transformation program. What then happens in that program is that most of the small tourism, um, um, uh, 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 tourism businesses have been helped to develop their websites. They have been helped with uh, technological tools that they can use to easily um, uh, uh, make bookings. Uh, they have been helped with some technological tools to manage their operations of their businesses. Uh, they have also been helped in terms of um, uh, packaging in a digital manner 
their products so that they can be presented in different tourism marketing platforms. Airbnb is an app that allows people to book accommodation. Many hotels showed dislike of it when it first launched because the app allows anyone to provide accommodation to holidaymakers. Airbnb says COVID changed the way people travel and accommodation they choose. And many of these communities are going to be smaller cities or even rural areas. Farm stays are huge now, national parks. They also say in 2021 in South Africa, 2 billion rand was made by many who choose the app to open up their spaces as accommodation offerings. Those in the industry encourage tourism players who are still scared of tech to give it a try. Fourth Industrial Revolution is part of the instrument that has been able to tell people in Australia, people in New Zealand, people in Canada, our visitors, that this time around, these are the things that are happening. While it might be a while before we meet robots and before all kinds of tests become biometric, what's clear is that the COVID-19 pandemic accelerated the use of tech for bookings, check-ins, and for service in the tourism sector. There are various initiatives that are assisting in helping people with disabilities and these innovations come from South Africa. Let's find out about some of them. South Africa is a country reeling from a gaping digital divide that leaves many lagging behind, especially when it comes to opportunities offered by the World Wide Web. Frustrating as it might be for those on the receiving end, what more for those living with disabilities who continue to be the most marginalized in this country? There's, a, there's, there's beautiful legislation, but there's very poor implementation, very, very poor implementation. Um, well, well, my experience lies with deaf people. Um, there, if, if a deaf person goes to something that's uh, widely available, such as SASA, if a deaf person goes to apply for a social grant, how is the deaf person supposed to communicate with the SASA official? SASA makes no provision for that, absolutely none. Juan Dandlovu, founder of Umbula Research and Development, is working on a wearable technology solution for translating sign language. So the first version of uh, the wearable classes that we launched uh, more than two years ago, it was, um, it was involving three players. One is a deaf person, a second player is a hearing person, and a third player is a sign language interpreter. So then uh, our solution was taking the signed uh, images from a deaf person and then pass it through to an interpreter. And an interpreter will then convert that into voice for the benefit of a hearing person. And then the communication will be vice versa. When a hearing person is communicating via voice, then that will be converted into sign language, but in the form of an interpreter. But since then, like any other technological product in the market, you launch it and then you always get a feedback from the market. So we have improved our solution now. Uh, what we are doing now is to minimize the human intervention. Right? So the wearable classes now um, is encoded now with the machine uh, learning uh, capabilities. So the wearable classes on its own can interpret and translate South African sign language and convert it into text. Incubated at the Innovation Hub, Wanda and his team are not only focused on the glasses, but also working on a number of tech solutions for those that are hard of hearing. We took it upon ourselves just to ensure that we digitize South African Sign Language or Sign Language in general, to ensure that most people, they start to learn Sign Language. So I'll give for an example. Um, a hearing person find it easy to search a how-to video on a digital platform. Whereas when it comes to a person who uses sign language, it's difficult to find content that is related to sign language. So that's one of the areas that we're focusing on. And then secondly, um, if you look at an entertainment industry, um, digital games mainly are done for hearing people, you've got the sound effect. But now that becomes difficult for a deaf person to play such games. And that's one of the areas that we're focusing at, is to ensure that we digitize games in a form of sign language. 
These young boys are using a switch that can be connected to various household appliances. Created by a company called Inclusive Solutions, this technology is aimed at helping those living with disabilities be active participants of everyday life. These solutions prove that technology is much needed to improve lives. Hopefully, like legislation, implementation of solutions for those living with disabilities will soon be perfected. It's SABC Network on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. News Network at sabc.co.za on email. After the break, we chat cyber security because of that transunion cyber breach. SABC Network on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram News Network at sabc.co.za on email. Welcome back. Now, TransUnion has been hacked and the story has been doing the rounds for the last couple of weeks in various media organizations. Reports say that the hackers want a ransom with millions and millions of South African rand from TransUnion. Now, TransUnion has said that they will not be paying this money. The threat is that the hackers will be releasing personal details of some South Africans, including the personal details of the president. Now, to help us understand hacking and cybersecurity, a bit better is Temba Ndubane from Masana Holdings. Hello and thank you very much for being a part of our network, Temba. Uh, now, maybe you can tell us about how a hacking actually can happen. It can happen if um, hackers get access to a private uh, network infrastructure of any company. It can be a, an organization. It can also be at individual level where they're able to, uh, using some online resources, be able to gain um, access to whether it is your internal systems. It can be a computer, it can be servers if it's a company, or if it's a government, you know, they can even go as far as their main mainframe, which will be hosting um, very big sizes of or, and amounts of data. And Timber, how can organizations protect the data that they have? Because many organizations have data of millions of South Africans in their safeguard. Well, the, the, the very first and most basic way is to have very strong passwords. Uh, we, we all know that most systems can be accessed through passwords. So, you know, you don't want to be having um, a system that is hosting very sensitive data to be having the simplest of passwords that can be easily guessed. Uh, most passwords these days should be a combination of letters, caps letters, special characters and numbers because then the metrics behind trying to crack or, or, or guess that kind of a password becomes very complicated which makes it difficult for hackers to be able to access uh, your systems. Then from there you know you have to have a very uh, powerful file that can be able to sense external intrusions. It can be able to sense that there's someone who is consistently trying to gain access into our private systems. And over and above that, you know, they, you also can employ, depending on the size of your company and you know, the budget that you have, we do have intrusion um, detecting systems. So that's all they do. And these are just dedicated servers that are monitoring your system and they can be able to sense uh, how many other external um, systems are actually trying to access your internal systems or in your internal infrastructure. Data breaches of various governments around the world and organizations seem to be increasing. What's causing this? Look, this spike is happening all over the world. It's not just South Africa, you know, it's a lot of countries outside there are also experiencing the same thing. And we as South Africa, we just unfortunately fast asleep in that we always thought we we're immune to such things. But we can see this, you know, sudden spike in a lot of uh, hacking that has been happening, whether for individuals or even companies, as we can see, you know, with the current situation with TransUnion. Reports say TransUnion hackers are asking for a ransom. Would you ever say there is a time that organizations which have been hacked should pay a ransom? Look, in principle, I would say it's not worth it paying a trans um, um, a, 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 um, um, this money that they, they, they are requesting because, you know, if someone has got access to your data, 
even if they say pay a certain amount, you're not guaranteed that even after paying that amount, you know, all of your data, you will get it back and that they will delete whatever they had on their side. So, you, you know, you might just be setting yourself to repetitive attacks and, you know, whatever data that has been compromised can still be out there and they can still use it to, you know, uh, try and get whatever um, ransom payment that they want until they get to a point where they feel they're satisfied or until they feel that whatever data they're trying to threaten you with is data that is useless to you. So, you know, in principle, if as a company you're able to establish the sensitivity of the data that has been uh, compromised and you feel you've got you know, good backups to be able to carry on with life and not worry about whatever data that they say they have access to, you know, it's not worth it paying a ransom. But in this case, you know, when it comes to TransUnion, unfortunately, the data that has been accessed is, you know, um, private data of not just the company itself, but also individuals out there, prominent individuals for that case, who, if their data can be leaked to the public, you know, it, it, will, it, will, it will cause a serious problem for, for TransUnion. So, each company would have to weigh the situation first before they can pay the ransom. But at the end of the day, you know, the more we're paying this ransom as companies or individuals, then we're encouraging um, these hackers to continue with their work. And, and they won't give up because it's easy cash for them. Now, Timba, beyond it being a conversation, because it seems to be a conversation we're having time and time again, do you think that cybersecurity is taken seriously enough in South Africa? No, we're not. We're not taking it seriously. Um, unfortunately, we in South Africa, we still have that culture of that DIY culture where we believe that there's a lot of things we can do ourselves. And we don't understand that in the IT world, um, security breaches are becoming more and more easier. All right, Timba Ndobane from the Masana Group. Thank you very much for being a part of our network. And with that, let's take a short break. It is the CBC Network on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram News Network at cbc.co.za on email. Welcome back. Here's what else took place in the rest of the world in the tech space. What stands on two wheels, walks on four legs, and can act as a car? Answer. ETH Zurich spin-off of Swiss Miles newest robot. The versatile four-legged robot on wheels is capable of standing up and navigating more difficult terrains, including stairs. It also can perform basic human-like tasks such as pressing buttons or operating a lever. So in this configuration, the robot can easily go and conquer any difficult terrain like stairs. And with this humanoid mode, the robot can actually stand up on two legs which increases the field of applications that the robot can do uh, drastically. The creation was presented by technology company NVIDIA during their keynote speech at an artificial intelligence conference. And now in Italy. Scientists at the Italian Institute of Technology have demonstrated long-distance telemetry to control a robot in Venus from their lab in Genoa. The team used a humanoid robot and iCub acting as an avatar to allow a researcher to explore the Italian pavilion at Venus without leaving the lab. The demonstration uh, involved a human operator here at IIT, Genoa, while its uh, physical avatar was at the Italian pavilion of Biennale di Venezia, Venice. Uh, so, uh, thanks to our research and technologies, we have been able to sync the human being with its corresponding avatar at about 300 kilometers away. And thanks only to a simple and classical fiber optic, optic, optic internet. The user wears sensorized gloves that track his hand motions and at the same time provide haptic feedback. The researchers say the system could have applications in healthcare, disaster recovery or assisting people with severe disabilities. Virtual reality and low latency 5G connections took the Mobile World Congress by storm. With around 50,000 visitors for the event in Barcelona, delegates hoped to attract visitors to their booth to showcase their latest technology. It's overwhelming. It's uh, beautiful how big the exhibition is, very diverse, lots of company from all over the place. It's really, really impressive. While the expected attendance for this year is less than half the 109,000 registered for 2019, it compares with roughly 20,000 attendees last year. 
Technology shows CES managed 40,000 participants in December. As for the very first time, a streaming service film won an Oscar award. This week, uh, Terapol is asking you how will you watch your feature films in 2022. Apple Plus TV's Coda won the Best Film Oscar. Now, 65% of you say you watch your films on streaming platforms. 20% of you in second place say on TV. Tied for last place is the cinema and the DVD. They're at 8%. And that's it. That's all we have for you. Find us on SABC Network on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. It's News Network at sabc.co.za on email from me as Pumela Lezondi and the rest of the network team. Have a good one. Bye-bye.